Hey up all, I'm Propagandist, and welcome to another Girls and Panzer related video. Now, a few months back I did a list of five historically significant tanks that have appeared at various points in the Girls and Panzer franchise, and that video went down well with all you viewers and vieweresses out there. So I've decided to do another video of a similar style, except this time looking at something slightly different. This time we're going to look at five all-round decent tank slash armoured vehicles that have appeared in the GUP franchise. So once again, the guidelines for this list are as follows. Number one, for a vehicle to make it on this list, it must have appeared in the GUP franchise at some point. And two, in real life, it must have been a decent all-round armoured vehicle, with a good record in all, or at least some of the following criteria, such as firepower, armour, rolls, mobility, crew survivability, ease of production, and ease of repair maintenance, etc. Now, I'll admit, this was a difficult list to actually compile, especially since I'm trying to distill it down to just five vehicles. There are a lot of tanks that have appeared in Girls on Panzer, which, in real life, prove themselves to be very good vehicles. So what I'm about to give in due course is a selection of some notable highlights. I also set myself some extra constraints to help narrow the list down. For example, with just one exception, I've actually tried to avoid including vehicles which were previously on my five historically significant tanks lists, so that, that way I can give the spotlight to other machines, including some less well-known ones. I've also aimed for some national diversity. Each of the five slots is taken up by a tank from a different country, so there are no instances of two or more vehicles from one particular state. Now, of course, this is all just my opinion. Furthermore, the tanks I'm about to go through are by no means listed or ranked in any particular order. They're just five vehicles which I think are worthy of discussion. If there are any other vehicles you think are worth talking about, which I don't cover here, feel free to mention them in the comments and we can have a good chat about them. In fact, I'll probably also give a list of honourable mentions towards the end of the video too. So without further ado, let's get into my list of five all-round decent tanks featured in Girls on Panzer. Number 1. The American M4 Sherman, as used by Saunders. Now, this is one of the tanks that I actually mentioned in my 5 Historically Significant Tanks video. In fact, it's the only one which I've actually decided to carry across to this video as well. I'll admit, I have developed a soft spot for the Sherman. It's probably one of my favourite World War II tanks, one which traditionally seems to get a lot of criticism from certain quarters. Now, in my five historically significant tanks video, I treated the Sherman in a somewhat cautious manner, mentioning the debates over its worth but not getting too deep into them. However, since then, I've actually encountered some really interesting material here on YouTube about the Sherman, namely videos posted by one Nicholas Moran, aka The Chieftain, US Armour Officer and now Historian for War Gaming. I can talk about the M4 for hours. My opinion of the Sherman has steadily gone up to the point where I'm now quite confident in putting it forward as an example of a tank that not only appeared in Girls and Panzer, but which in real life was also a decent machine. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not some Sherman fanboy who thinks it abs had absolutely no flaws whatsoever, but I do disagree with those internet armchair historians who argue that Sherman was a pile of junk with no value whatsoever. For me, the truth is in the middle. The reason for this is because if there's one thing I've taken from various sources is that most of the criticism of the Sherman is contentious and there are counter arguments to suggest it was actually a pretty decent tank for its time. The criticism that the Sherman burned easily, for instance, came from the ammunition easily igniting due to the way it was stored, but this was a problem that was corrected with the introduction of wet stowage, so to me it seems unfair to write the Sherman off for a problem that was actually addressed and dealt with. Now I mentioned the logistical advantage of the Sherman in my Historically Significant Tanks video. That's one of the main reasons why I like this tank, because if you're fighting an industrial war on a huge geographical scale, then what you want is something simple that can be mass-produced and shipped out to the field in large numbers. But to this I would also add that, whilst it may not have had the thickest armour or the strongest gun on the battlefield, particularly in the later years of World War II, Sherman was capable of handling itself against a plethora of weapons that the Germans were equipped with, such as Panzer III's and IVs. 
Plus, you have to remember that Sherman was not a weapon to be used on its own, in isolation from everything else. It was part of a combined whole, operating alongside infantry and artillery, with tactical air support. On top of that, it's also a reliable and easy to repair vehicle, going back to the whole logistical issue that, in a total conventional war, you want something that isn't going to break down very often, and which, if it does break down, can be repaired relatively quickly. I find that some internet debates tend to focus on the Sherman from a very tactical point of view, but tactics is just one aspect of warfare. Strategy and logistics are arguably of greater importance, and looking at the Sherman through those lenses, it's a good machine. So with all of this in mind, I hope that it is clear why Sherman is included on this list of all-round decent tanks to have appeared in Girls on Panzer. Number 2. The German Sturmgeschutz III, as used by Ori's Hippo team. Now this next entry isn't technically a tank, it's a self-propelled gun. The Sturmgeschutz III is one of Germany's most well-known assault guns of World War II, and it quite rightly developed a fearsome reputation for what it could do. Germany had a lot of iconic self-propelled guns, of course. Vehicles like the Jagdpanther and Jagdtiger spring to mind. But it is the Stug III that stands above these, and when you consider the factors going in its favour, it's not hard to see why. For a start, the Stug III really proved itself in a role for which it was not originally designed. The truth was that it was conceived of as a machine that would provide direct fire support to infantry, but as the war progressed and Germany found itself in retreat, the Stug III came to be one of the Wehrmacht's principal tank destroyers. The low silhouette made it a perfect ambush weapon, facilitating easier concealment, which, incidentally, is one of the reasons why I chose this vehicle over other German SPGs, such as the aforementioned Jagdpanther or Jagdtiger. On top of that, as the war progressed, Stug III variants were progressively upgunned to give them more firepower. But as well as this, there are some other rather telling facts that, I would argue, reveal how valuable the Stug III was to Germany. It was the second most produced German armoured vehicle of World War II, and given that it employed a casemate structure rather than a turret, it was cheaper and faster to produce than other German tanks of the time. The omission of the turret also allowed for a larger gun to be mounted on the chassis. Now of course, as was the case with the previously mentioned Sherman, the Stug III wasn't perfect, it did have some flaws of its own. Namely, the omission of a turret did mean that it was most suitable for particular activities, such as direct fire support or defensive ambushes. But when it came to spearheading an offensive, Stug III was obviously not a candidate for this role. But, despite this, I do feel that it is worthy of being included on this list. Number 3. Italian Semavente 7518, as used by Anzio. Since we're including SPGs as well as conventional tanks, and since, as I stated earlier, I wanted to get some geographical spread on this list, for my next armoured vehicle I decided to pick something that ordinarily might have been overlooked. In essence, I wanted something of a wildcard entry, one that perhaps you might not have even thought about, never mind expected. Coming up here is a much less discussed vehicle, but one which I feel is worthy of being included in this video, the Italian Semavente 7518. Now, Italy in World War II wasn't exactly famed for producing amazing tanks, and even though the Semavente 7518 isn't technically a tank, it's a SPG, just like the aforementioned Stug III, it still stands out as an example of where the Italians actually had a pretty good weapon. So I feel that it's time to give Italian armour designers some praise for a change, hence why I decided to include this machine on the list. In a manner of speaking, the Semavente can be seen as a kind of Stug light. Its technical specifications were maybe not quite as good as those of its German counterpart. For example, Stug 3 had a top speed of 25 miles an hour, whereas the Semavente's top speed tended to be around 20 to 21 miles an hour. However, it had other things going in its favour. Compared to other Italian tanks, it had slightly better armour, and much like the Stug 3, it had the advantage of a low silhouette. Alongside these, the Semavente's combat record showed the vehicle's usefulness. Similarly to the Stug 3, the Semavente proved itself in roles for which it was not intended. Originally intended for use as an artillery piece, these SPGs soon proved themselves useful in an anti-tank role, as their 75mm howitzers were good for firing high-explosive anti-tank shells.
In June 1942, during the Battle of Gazala, the Semaventes helped to repel an Allied attack on a position held by the Italian Arete Division, fending off M3 Grants and M3 Stuarts. This example is held up as one of their most successful actions. Of course, as is the case with pretty much any armoured vehicle, there are caveats that must be borne in mind. Ultimately, Semaventes were never deployed en masse, and as such there simply weren't enough of them to prevent the tide of the war from turning against Italy. Plus, the same caveats mentioned in reference to the Stug III do also apply to the Semavente. Nevertheless, I still believe that Semavente is a worthy addition to this list of decent, all-round fighting vehicles, tanks, as used by St. Gloriana. Now initially, I was thinking about including the British Centurion on this list. After all, given that I wanted a geographical spread, and given that it appeared in GUP, then the Centurion would be a logical pick for a British tank that performed well in real life. However, I talked about the Centurion in my 5 Historically Significant Tanks video, and rather than end up just repeating a load of what I said previously, I instead decided to go for something different, for the sake of mixing things up a little. Now, Britain in World War II often had problems with tank design. The country fielded some notable types of armoured vehicle, such as the Matilda II, the Crusader and more, but quite often these had their own drawbacks, whether that was weaker firepower that ultimately couldn't fare well against the advancement of German tank design, mechanical unreliability in certain environments, low armour or any number of factors. The Churchill tank is an interesting one to add to this list. A, hev a big, heavy behemoth of a machine, it went through numerous developments during its lifespan, with new variants seeing gradual improvements. In its earlier years, the Churchill tank was not brilliant. So why, might you ask, do I include it on this list? Well, to put it simply, once you get to the later variant Churchills, particularly from the Mark VII onward, this is where the tank really shines. Churchill Mark VII's and onwards proved their worth as fighting machines. The Mark VII brought in thicker armour, giving the tank more protection. And though the guns used on different variants of the Churchill, such as the earlier 6-pounder or the later QF 75mm, were not always perfect, they did generally get the job done. In fact, there are accounts of Churchill tanks engaging the likes of the German Tiger and coming out on top such as at the Battle of Longstop Hill in 1943, in which a Churchill, in hull-down position, was able to neutralise a Tiger. Incidentally, there's an interesting little anecdote here. That same Tiger was then captured by the British. Known as Tiger 131, it was restored to full working condition and survives to this day at the Tank Museum in Dorset, UK. If there's one criticism that sometimes gets levelled at the Churchill, it's that they were slow in terms of speed. However, I do think that this criticism needs to be balanced with a counter-argument. Yes, Churchill was a slow tank, but what's important to remember is that it was classed as an infantry tank. What this means is that it was not meant to be a fast tank to begin with. As an infantry tank, its purpose was to operate alongside and support slower moving infantry. And on top of that, Churchill was still a relatively mobile tank, in the sense that it could climb steeper hills and terrain that other tanks couldn't. So, on the whole, despite a chequered development history, I still feel that Churchill is worth mentioning on this list. Number 5. Soviet KV-1 Tank, as used by Pravda. Now for my fifth and final place on this list, I wanted something Russian. After all, you can't have a video on World War II tanks without reference to something from the motherland. At first, I was torn between the T-34 or the IS-2, both of which were generally good tanks. However, I talked about the T-34 in my Historically Significant Tanks video, so decided not to include it here, otherwise a good portion of this video would just be me repeating a load of stuff from there. So initially, I was going to go with the IS-2. But then I decided to actually change that and go for something else, something of a more wildcard entry, something completely different, and admittedly, perhaps a bit more likely to elicit some debate. In short, I went with the KV-1. Now some of you might be confused here. Propagandist, you might ask, didn't you say that this is a list of tanks that have appeared in Girls and Panzer? If so, then where did the KV-1 appear? Those are good questions. After all, from what I remember, it wasn't featured in the TV series, the OVAs or their film. However, those of you who follow Girls and Panzer's manga adaptations might be aware of the saga of Pravda manga. 
it is there where the KV-1 has appeared, so technically, the inclusion of the KV-1 does not break my aforementioned rule. In real life, the KV-1 was a Soviet heavy tank, fielded in the war with Finland that began in 1939, and in response to the German Operation Barbarossa in 1941. One of the most notable advantages of the KV-1 was its heavy armour, 90mm at the front, and roughly 70mm along the sides and rear. German Panzer 3s and 4s simply could not deal with it, as their own guns just couldn't punch through. Meanwhile, the KV-1's own gun was quite capable of dealing with the likes of 3s and 4s. So in order to beat this thing, the Germans had to get tactical, setting traps to lure the KV-1s towards heavy artillery, or into spaces where they could be flanked and dealt with by infantry. So not a bad tank by any means. However, I wouldn't say it was perfect either. Some sources suggest that the KV-1 could be a bit of an unwieldy vehicle. I've also seen claims that the crew's vision from within the tank was not great either. And of course, as the war progressed, and the Germans fielded more powerful tanks and anti-tank guns, the KV-1's armour became less effective. But of course, can anyone point me to a single tank in history that has either never had a single flaw somewhere in its design, or which has never ultimately been surpassed by subsequent advancements in weapon design? The answer to that is no, because war and military design is a game of constant one-upmanship. One side will field something that dominates the battlefield for a time, but eventually the opponent will produce something that can counter it, and round and round the cycle goes. So, for a period in the early years of World War II, the KV-1 was certainly a decent tank, even if it would eventually be surpassed by later German and Russian designs, such as the Tigers, T-34s and IS-2s. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of my list of five all-round decent tanks that have appeared in the Girls and Panzer franchise. As mentioned earlier, these were not ranked in any particular order, plus, actually deciding on five tanks out of such a huge range of choices was quite difficult. For that reason, I'd like to list some honourable mentions here as well. If this had been a longer list, say 10 rather than 5 for example, then other tanks I might have chosen to talk about, which do appear in GUP as well, include the Soviet T-34 and IS-2 mentioned a moment ago, the British Centurion mentioned earlier, other German tanks, such as later variant Panzer Force, or even perhaps the Tiger, or perhaps even the French Sommer S-35. So of course, feel free to leave your own thoughts down in the comments. Were there any tanks I didn't mention, which you think would be equally worthy of this list? Feel free to let me know below, and we can have a discussion. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me for another list of Girls and Panzer tanks. I hope you uh, enjoyed this video. If you're not aware already, General Red Propagandist is my second channel. My main channel is General Red Strategist, where I do a lot of gaming content. So if you're interested in that, you can find a link to it in the video description down below, along with links to the channel's associated social media pages. But other than that, thank you once again, everybody. I'll probably be doing another list of this kind sometime in the hopefully not too distant future, except that this time, I'll be talking about the worst tanks to have appeared in GUP, since I think that will be an interesting one. So uh, you have that to look forward to whenever that appears. But in the meantime, I'm going to go now. So, goodbye everybody!